Hello, so I'm going to do something today that I have not done before, which is I'm going to show you the complete list of potential ME-CFS and fibromyalgia and gulf illness and long COVID treatments that I would like to test in clinical trials. I'm presenting this list at a conference talk that I'm giving later this week on pain and addiction, but I'm going to show it to you first. By the way, I'm Dr. Younger, and I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory. So first, before I show you the list, and it's quite a long list, let me quickly remind you of what I'm trying to do with these potential treatments, potential treatments. My goal is to push microglia cells, which are in this chronic inflammatory state. And these microglia are immune cells in our brain. And I think when they're in an inflammatory state, they cause cognitive issues, fatigue, pain sensitivity, and, and other problems. And so my goal is to take those cells that are stuck in the inflammatory condition and push them either to the resting state where they're not producing these inflammatory chemicals that make you feel horrible or push them to the neuroprotective state. Now, if you don't know what microglia are or how they cause chronic disease, I'll link to some of my previous talks covering those topics at the end of this video. So the agents I'm about to show you are pharmaceuticals and botanicals that have demonstrated impact on microglia. They have the impacts on microglia that I'm looking for in potential treatments for these chronic diseases. And they've been shown at minimal Minimum, they've been shown in kind of test tubes to push microglia in the direction that I'm looking for. Now, there's some really important caveats before I show this list. I need to make it really clear that these are experimental compounds. Some of these agents have never been tested in humans at all. So this is absolutely not a list of things for you to start researching to look for treatments for yourself. It's too preliminary, it's too early. We have to do more testing before we can recommend any of these potential treatments in this list. So there's not enough support for them. So the question is, is why am I even showing the list? And I have colleagues who would recommend that I not share a list like this because the information can be misused. There's a couple reasons why I want to share something like this. Uh, one, I just want you to know that there are so many possibilities to beating these disorders. Uh, so it's not the case that we've run out of ideas. Far from it, we've got so many possible treatments that it's almost overwhelming the possibilities, which is a good thing. It means we have plenty to do to figure out these disorders. The other reason I want to show the list is because I just want to be transparent in my science and in the works. You can see how it actually is done. And that's because, as I've said before, science tends to be quite secretive. Uh, and scientists usually want to keep things to themselves until they're ready to publish the final results. So someone doesn't, what we call, scoop the idea and run it themselves, because that can really hurt a researcher if they've got this big idea and then someone else finds out about it, and then that other group does it and beats the previous researcher to getting their results out. And that's happened, gosh, I mean, hundreds of thousands of times, and it's a serious thing. But in this case, I don't really care because, as you're going to see, there's so many possibilities, there's so many ideas, there's no reason for me to be possessive with the ideas because there's enough for everyone. And as long as these clinical trials get done and they're done well, that's what really matters. It doesn't matter if it's me or if it's a, another research group. So that's another reason to get the list out because I hope some other researchers will take some of these on and run the trials. So here's the list. I'm not gonna talk about any of these agents individually, or I'm not even going to highlight any of them. As you might could guess, some of these are particularly interesting to me, but I'm not going to mention that. I'll do other videos highlighting the ones that I think should be uh, prioritized. So let me show you what this looks like. The compound is on the left. That's the name of the compound. The middle compound, the middle column is how the drug is available and if the drug is available for human use. So is it available by prescription? 
Is it um, available over the counter? Uh, is it not available at all? And then the last column are just some shorthand notes for me. So on this first page, you're seeing all pharmaceuticals. And if they have a number instead of a name, that usually means that they're so early in testing, they don't even have a name yet, and they're owned by a specific company. And those can be particularly difficult to get a hold of for testing. On page two, it moves from pharmaceuticals to botanicals. And of course, botanicals are more likely to be available. And on the last page, you see more botanicals of interest and then a few other uh, chemicals that I'm interested in and how they affect microglia functioning. So that's a few dozen compounds. It would take me a few lifetimes to get through all of those running clinical trial after clinical trial because of how long it takes to do a proper clinical trial. So it's really essential that I prioritize these and I run the most promising first. And the way I do that is with this checklist I'm going to show you. This is Jared's microglia modulation prioritization checklist. The more checks a compound has, the higher it is prioritized for me. So first of all, it has to show an ability to push microglia in the direction I need them to go in the test tube. Then it should show that same effect, but in an actual living organism. So instead of the test tube, it's when you inject it in an animal model, for example, and I don't do animal research, so I, I rely on other groups to have done this work and published it, but it should show that in a living human or a living organism because sometimes things look great in the test tube, but then they don't work when they're injected in a, in a living organism. So then evidence of blood-brain barrier penetrability. So it has to get through the blood-brain barrier and reach the microglia in the brain where they're at. Then if there's now, as we get further down this list, it's less likely that this these data are available, but the more the better. The next step is it's great if some group has shown that that compound actually helps an animal model. So if it's an animal inflammatory or autoimmune model, if this agent improves that condition, improves the animal's um, you know, movement, functioning, and seems to resolve the issue, that gives me even more confidence that this would work in humans. Next step, if it's already been tested in enough humans to say that it's safe, I really like compounds that have already been safety tested. That means I don't have to do that work myself. I'm willing to do that, and it has to be done for new agents, but it's better if it's already been done. And then the last thing is if it's, if it's ever been used in any human patient, even if it's not related to ME-CFS or fibromyalgia, maybe if it's been used for lupus or multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis, but if it's been used in human patients successfully, that gives me more confidence that it is, it's a useful drug. So again, the more checkbox, the higher it gets put into that list. And by the way, the list I just showed you, the three pages, that is not a prioritized list. That is virtually a, a random list. It's not alphabetized. It's really, it's kind of more the order that I discovered the compound. So it's kind of more of a chronological list, but the, the listing, the order is completely meaningless. There's no information there. I'll be talking later about creating a prioritized list and showing which agents rise to the top and which ones I'm likely to stress in my future clinical trials. So what's next? Well, we're having meetings this week on progressing clinical trials, particularly for myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. There's a big push for more clinical trials, which I'm very glad to see. Um, as I mentioned last week, I'll be pushing as much as I can for the formation of specialized clinical trial centers. I think that's what it may take to get through all these clinical trials quickly. We need centers that know how to deal with fibromyalgia, particularly how to deal with ME-CFS and other complex disorders. So I'll talk about that soon, and I'll talk about the best way that um, these may be funded and how we're going to get the money and how much they might cost and, and how, again, how that can be done. So really, that's 
that's it. That's what I wanted to show to you. you know, I hope that gives you a better picture on how important it is that I make wise decisions on which compounds to test because there are so many good options or promising options. There's not enough time and there's not enough money to run them all. And so it's critically important that I select the right ones to try because of how much investment there is in running them and, and testing them. So that's it for today. And I hope you can make it back next week and I'll be talking more about the, uh, the recent science. Thanks.